shout out our praise, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Amen. Praise God. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. Aren't you glad to be here today in the house of the Lord? There's joy here today. We get to celebrate what God is doing and what he has done. We get to give him thanks because everybody didn't make it into this year, you know? And so we're excited to see what God is doing in and through and with us. And so we're continuing our series this morning in the beginning, rediscovering God's purpose and plan for our lives. And we're going through the Old Testament together. Often people kind of avoid the Old Testament. So we're, we're in the messiness of all that's going on, right? Somebody tell me, why did Cain kill Abel? <laughs> what is going on out here? God had to destroy the earth because we uh, decided we knew better than him. All kind of stuff just happening, and it's like good grief. And the Bible is, is juicier than any of this nonsense you watch on television, man. There's some stuff going on in here. I'm like disturbed, frankly, not even PG. But anyway, rediscovering God's purpose and plan. So last time we spoke, we went from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation 20, 20, 22 and I think it was verses 3 through 5. So we covered the entire Bible in one message. So now we want to come back to Genesis, take our time and go through, and we're going to spend much of our time this year in the New Testament, more Old Testament, I'm sorry, paralleling what we're doing in our reading plan. If you're not participating with that, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Uh, the, the plan is probably still outside on the table, but jump in because you're really, um, you're missing some amazing stuff. And so we're back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 primarily, and we're going to just talk about the fundamentals. And I want to, as I'm working to have my mind transformed, I hope that you will participate in that process and understand God's intention, his design, his plan, and his purpose for our lives. Okay, so the central jumping right in, central kingdom principle, I hope you have your notebooks out. We'll try to cover a decent amount of ground today, but take your notebooks out. Please spend time over the course of the week reviewing and letting this stuff sink in. And so the central kingdom principle today, or what we call the sermon in the sentence, my purpose in life is found in relationship with and obedience to God. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and actually verse 12, so this is written by Solomon, the wisest man that ever exists. He says, listen, to the writing of books, there is no end. He says, studying can weary you. And I'm a learner. I love to read. I love to study. But he's like, listen, at the end of the day, you can study all you want. You can read all you want. You can go to lectures and seminars and workshops, and that's all fine. But he says, the bottom line is this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. You're trying to figure it out, and what's my prayer? What am I supposed to? He said, here it is, right here in a sentence. Fear God. That means to reverence God, to honor him, to acknowledge him for who he is, and keep his commandments. He says, for this is the duty of all mankind. He says, there it is. If you're wondering, you're trying to figure it out, and you're wrestling, he says, when in doubt, do these two things. Fear God, reverence him, acknowledge him for who he is, and do the best that you can in keeping his commandments. He says, and this is the reason, this is the purpose, this is the assignment, this is the mission of mankind. Isn't that good? Amen. I can sit down. Call it a day. <laughs> He'll say, go ahead. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> All right, so we, we, want, <laughs> we want to dig in just a little bit more. I got a couple minutes left. So anybody see this? Anybody know what this is? Anybody have a, a, a sense of, of, of what this is? See, this question of what something is, what its purpose is, and what problem that it solves is critical to understanding whether we're talking about ourselves or something, piece of equipment that we buy, right? Because if we do not know what something is for, we are inclined to abuse it, misuse it. Maybe there's a couple of you who know for sure, but anybody, give me some guesses. If you, if you know for sure, don't say anything, but any, any guesses on what this might be? You know, Brother Romy, if you know, I don't want you to say, I said, don't raise your hand <laughs> if you know. Somebody who's 
maybe know or trying to figure it out or what, doesn't know. What do, what do you think? Give me some guesses. A bottle opener? Okay. Yes, sir. An extraction tool of some kind? Okay. With something to pull something out of something. All right. All right, bottle opener, something to extract, extract something out of something. What else? Any other guess? Got some nods on the, I see if I was on Zoom, I'd do a poll. Y'all be like, yeah, the extraction. Something to hold something together. Something to hold something together. All right, well, very good. Those are great guesses, but they're all a little bit off. And so it actually is for paint brushes and We'll say extracting, we'll go with that, but it's to get the paint or even the water out of the brush once you've gotten it wet with the paint or whatever. You put it in and then you pump it and it spins the brush or it spins the roller. You can slide it here, you can see how it works. So it's, you slide it into the roller, right? You got paint on the roller, you know how, listen, me, I'm gonna be honest, I end up throwing rollers away, right? You finish, you're like, ah. So this thing, first of all, you spin it and get the excess paint out put it in the water, get it full of water, then you spin it again, you have a brand new, fresh, dry roller. Or same thing with the brush, the paintbrush. You slide it into the little grabber part thing, put it in, spin it around, get the paint out, put it in the water, boom. You finish, put it back in the little case that it came in, you got a brand new brush. But if you don't know the purpose, right, my sister back here trying to open a bottle with this thing, <laughs> tearing up the bottle, <laughs> right? But why? She didn't know what the purpose was. And so it's hugely important to understand. And when you don't know what the purpose of something, and now today, of course, we go to YouTube, right? So if there is no explainer video, what do you do? You try to find either the creator or the owner's manual. And you notice you get the silliest little thing today, and they have like in five and seven different languages what the instructions are. Right? And so it's important that we discover when there's something we don't know what to do with it. Now, this thing, right? Everybody in here probably has one of these. The baby's got one of these. Right? What, let me ask you a question. What, what is the purpose of this thing? What is it for? What does it do? Somebody said communication. And, and who in here makes calls on the phone? That's probably the least of use I have on my phone. <laughs> what else do you do with it? It's a research tool, okay. What else? Directions, GPS. It's a camera. It's a video camera. It's a calculator. It's a computer. A calendar. And we, and we call it a cell phone, I don't know why. Ain't nobody saying, oh yeah, I make some, oh yeah, by the way, I make some calls on it once in a while. <laughs> right? And the killer is there's so much stuff in this thing that you don't even know, that I don't even know, we haven't begun to draw out. And here's the thing, watch this. Y'all see all these apps? I'm on page, what, 10 or 12? And you know what, you know how many I use? Let me show you. I, I, use, I use homepage, <laughs> right? But the point is, I got some stuff on here. If I had the time and could figure it out, I'd be amazing. Right? But we have entertainment. This thing does all kinds of things. But the question is, what problem does it solve? And this is a hugely important question, particularly for those of you who are entrepreneurs, and I would argue we all are. But do you realize solving problems is why we're here? And do you realize that people's pay often is based on the magnitude of the problem that they solve? Amen? Listen, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with working in a fast food restaurant. Nothing. It's fine. But who gets paid more? A brain surgeon or somebody on the, on the fryer? Brain surgeon. Brain surgeon gets paid more? Why? Because of, right. because of the nature and the magnitude of the problem that they solve. Have you thought about that? So for those of you who are in business, the bigger the problem that you solve, the more people are willing to pay you, right? If your hair is all over your head, people are willing to pay for that. Amen? 
You know, there, there are multi-million dollar hairdressers and people who own salons. Why? They solving big problems for people. Now, I don't worry about that because I don't have that problem. Brother Romy don't have that problem. Right? Hairdressers would be in trouble if they would depend on Brother Romy. <laughs> but there's other people. Me too. Why are you playing? There's other people, however, that they make fortunes off of the problem of hair. Right? Bro Brother Eric Cargo is an electrician. Let your power go out. And your house caught you on fire. And he show up, and he say, well, you know I got a, a $100 show up fee. Listen, when you're in trouble, and, and, and the electrician's one thing, but let it be the plumber. Amen? And your plumbing ain't working? Or let's say your plumbing is working in reverse? You ever had, by the time they get there, you don't even care? You're like, man, I don't care what it costs. Get it fixed. Listen, my furnace went out last winter. Do you think I really care what it costs? My wife was like, uh, babe. <laughs> I was like, oh, say less. I don't like being cold. And so what the person charged was secondary. Because why? The problem, the magnitude of the problem that they solved, that I had, was hugely important. And so this question is one that we wrestle with. Now, this was my wife and my oldest Baby, this was a uh, picture was taken in August of 2000, no, 1990. Do we ask the question? We, I distinctly remember sitting in the hospital. And so I think back then, I think you probably maybe stayed two days. And so we're in the hospital and we're looking at each other and they're talking about um, checking us out. And we were like, you gonna let us take this child home we haven't had a class. There is no book, no manual, no training, no nothing. I'm like, are y'all crazy? This is the most irresponsible thing in the world. You gonna let this guy, I'm, I think I'm 24, 25, she's 24, 25, and they're gonna let us take this child out? And guess what? They do it all day, every day. Amen. That's frightening. Seriously. That's terrifying. And we have no preparation, no training, no nothing. And then we expect to raise children into reasonable adults. Unbelievable. And so the beautiful part is that we have a creator. And God created us. And he gave us instruction. And so a key truth first is God is the creator and owner of everything. This is hugely important. This is probably the, arguably the verse, most important verse in the Bible. It says, in the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. This is the fundamental supposition upon which everything else is based if we are a citizen of the kingdom of God, if we are a Christ follower, a Christian. And whether we, if we accept this or not, again, fundamental decision in the world, is God the creator and therefore, he has the right to guide and direct us. Now, trying to figure out how to use the little uh, paint spinner, if you didn't know what you were doing, you talk to the creator, you look at the manual, and they explain to you, or you try to figure it out. You open the models, you're trying to pull stuff out, the, whatever you're doing with it, right? And meanwhile, you're jacking it up, and you're not maximizing the tool. And so if we want to get maximum use out of our life. If we want to know our purpose, our call, God's intention for our lives, it begins with understanding that God is the creator and owner of everything. And the point is reiterated in Genesis chapter 2. So chapter 1, broad overview of creation. Chapter 2 delves a little bit more deeply. He says, this is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created, when God made the earth and the heavens. Did you buy that? Because if you buy it, it takes us back to our original sermon in the sense. It's like, if God is who he says he is, then the secret to our purpose, our mission, our calling, our reason for being is two things. is to reverence him and to obey his commands. And in that, we will find our purpose, our joy, our fulfillment, all of life 
can be found in that understanding. Psalm 24 and 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It says everything belongs to God, which means we don't have the right to do what we please. You see, we have stuff, we even have family, we have children. And we say, these are my children. I, you can't tell me what. The Bible says that those are God's children. And so that lens changes everything. If your children are God's children, then how you raise them actually becomes a function of what does God say about how to raise children. Not what mama did, not what great grandmama did. You know, you, you know, I know some crazy people. And they say, well, look at me. You see how I turned out? And you're like, <laughs> you're like, whoo, you are exhibit A for what the problem is. And you're like, I turned out okay. You're like, no, you didn't. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Key truth number two, everything God created is good. Everything God created is good. And it's interesting, if you're in Genesis chapter 1, you're reading with us, in verse 10, he says he created the land, and God says it was good. And then in verse 12, it says he created all the plants and the trees, and he says it was good. Then verse 18, it says the light for the day and the light to rule the night, the sun, the moon, and he says, guess what, it was good. And then verse 21, he creates the birds, the animals, and at the end of that day, he says it was good. And then verse 25. The rest of the, the creeping things, he says, and it was good. And then God steps back at the end of day six, and he has created human beings, and God says, it says, he saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. It was evening, and the morning, and the sixth day. And so when we look at life, and even its challenges, and even its difficulties, and see, this is a tough one, right? Do we believe that God, in Romans 8, 29, 28 and 29, tells us what? And God says, for those who love him, all things. Now, they may not be good in the sense that they're desirable to us, but he says he orchestrates them or he uses them, utilizes them for our ultimate good. And even the difficult thing, and here's the thing, the beautiful part is Christ followers. Worst case scenario, if we die, that says, the Bible says to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. Worst case scenario. So the interim, God says, I'm going to orchestrate your difficulties, your challenges. I may be teaching you faith. I may be teaching you patience. Anybody go to the grocery store recently? Yeah. And the line is in the back by the milk. <laughs> but we get to learn patience. Right? You get that flat tire, and you were running an hour late already? Get that flat, and, and then you learn what? Leave house a little bit early. Or, you know, maybe those bald head tires. You know, it wasn't the enemy attacking you. The tires have 75,000 miles on them, the cords are showing. It's time to get them new tires. Right? But God orchestrates even our difficult things for our good. Next key truth, God blessed us and gave us delegated dominion over the earth. This is hugely important. I say this often. But if we get this, we stop blaming other people. We stop blaming other situations and circumstances. We take ownership for what is going on in the world and even what is going on in our own lives. The Bible says in Genesis 126, second half of 26, he says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of heaven, over the livestock, over all the earth, over everything. The earth is ours. When God created us, he had a conversation with himself. He says, let's create mankind, and we're going to give them rule. We're going to give them dominion over the entire earth. And so what goes on in the earth, we have the ability to influence it. Some of us, that, that's amazing news. That's great news. That the things that are going on in our life, we don't have to be victims of them. But he says, I've given you dominion. I've given you authority. If there are things that are going on in your life that you don't like, you have the ability to intervene through prayer, through fasting, 
through relationship with other believers. He says, where two or three are gathered, I'm there in their presence. We can invoke his presence and his help to intervene in our lives. And he says, we have dominion. And verse 28 says, and God blessed them. Before we did anything, we were blessed. It says God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful. That means be productive. We are supposed to be productive people. Right? Laziness is not supposed to be a thing among God's people. We are supposed to use the gifts, the talents, the abilities that God has given us. We're supposed to use a lot, utilize those to do something productive in the earth, to make earth, as we often say, more like heaven. We're supposed, there, you have a redemptive domain, if you will. There is a kingdom territory over which you have absolute influence and power and control. It may simply be your house, in your apartment, in your studio. You go home to your studio, you look around and say, I'm the king or I'm the queen here. I get to say what happens here. I get to influence the atmosphere of this space. I get to make it feel more like God's will being done on earth like it is in heaven. Right? And then if you own some property, you have a car, you can say, this is a kingdom car. I get to decide how fast it drives. I get to decide if it runs through red lights or not. I get to decide if it runs up on the back of people. I get to decide. I have the influence. I am the kingdom influence. I have the dominion. I am the king or the queen over this situation. So he says, be productive. And then multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Adam was by himself. We'll talk about that in a second. But God says, fill the earth. Do you know that's a pretty big job? Can you imagine? It's like you by yourself. God said, fill the earth. It's like, what? He says, fill the earth and then subdue it. Listen, do you know I believe that God is, is excited when we create inventions that make life better? You think about all of the diseases and the conditions that people had in the scriptures for which they needed to be healed. Listen, right now, I can neither see nor hear y'all. Where'd y'all go? Any other people in here like this, and some of y'all pretending y'all got stuff you stick in your eyes. This little invention right here, I am, watch this, healed. I'm he do you see this? I'm healed, watch this, boom, I'm healed. So my blindness, right, I'm like the guy who Jesus started healing. He says, I see men as trees. He wasn't quite there. Listen, these simple things, and it's funny, like, I'm nearsighted. My wife is farsighted, and so we help each other. Babe, what that sign say? She's like, I don't know. What does this say? <laughs> right? And we're back and forth helping each other. But because of these, we are healed. You don't think that God gave someone the idea for this? I was reading the paper the other day. They put a pig heart in somebody. I think the guy's still alive. What in the world? That is unbelievable. But I believe that God is excited when we, as his creation, subdue the earth, when we discover how to use the things, the elements that he's put in the ground to create stuff. Do you realize everything that we make stuff out of is already here? God is not adding any new elements. No, this thing right here, all this thing that this does, these are just elements putting together different things that God has put on the earth from the beginning of the time when he created. And he said, have dominion. Take the stuff that I put into the ground and the ideas that I put into your head and combine them to do amazing and sophisticated stuff to make life better for the world. You think about it, I used to get lost all the time. But as long as I got some juice, and a signal, I'm not even worried. I go places where I have no idea where I'm going all the time. Listen, when I was growing up, this didn't happen until 2007, right? Before this thing, or before GPS, I get on the bus and go where the bus was taking me. See what I'm saying? You remember the bus schedule? Anybody remember bus schedules? <laughs> I mean, you at the stop, and you look at it, does my bus stop here? You standing doing all this here. Now they got an app telling you how close the bus is. You get stuck sometime, I'm going to take the busway, the 74, the 71D, or the 88. Because you got options now. Which one is closest? Because of this technology. 
And so all of the things, the healing, people, we have, people have heart attacks. They put a stent in and open up their blood vessels. Right? We, in here, we got all kind of extra knees going on and eyes and ears, all kinds of stuff going on because we subdue the earth. Right? Hips, lips, hair. You mean there's real hair, some of hair, some of your hair, some of their hair, y'all weave the hair together, all kind of hair. Listen, these are amazing inventions that make the quality of our life better. Microwaves, think about that. Man, I would probably be 15 pounds if I had to wait for the oven and all that, or I just eat cold food. No, you boop, 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 boop. 30 seconds later, you eat hot food. It's amazing. But that's simply subduing the earth, using the dominion that God gave us, delegated authority. Genesis chapter 9. Now, it's interesting. The earth was destroyed. Sin had gotten so rampant, God was tired of us. He floods the earth. Destroys everybody but this one guy, his family. And then when they come out of the ark, verse nine, chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, and God blessed Noah. Listen, the blessing thing happened again. We're blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. And then, and his sons. And he said, then what? The same thing. Y'all be productive and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth. And then verse 2 is reaffirming his relationship to the animals. And the fear and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Have dominion over the earth. The next one, God created us to solve a problem. This is where we started. God created you. He created me to solve problems. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, and then verse 15. No shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, because the Lord had not sent rain on the earth, and watch this, and there was no one to work the ground. God said, there's a problem. He says, I want to plant these plants and these trees and so forth, but I can't do it yet, because why? There's nobody to work it, to till it, to manage it, and to cultivate the earth. And so then God solves the problem, and he shows Adam what the solution is, God took the man and put him in the garden to do what? To work it and take care of it. So do you realize that we were created to work? This was even before the E thing. This dude had a job. Amen. Everybody needs a job. Amen. A job is not a curse. You see, oftentimes people feel like, well, you know, jobs didn't happen until after sin. They were just walking around eating neck, uh, naked and eating fruit and stuff. It's like, no. <laughs> It says God created him to work. And in fact, he says he couldn't even finish the creation until there was a man to care for the world. And so the question, of course, the natural question becomes, what problem did God put you here to solve? Have you ever thought about that question? What problem? What thing bothers you? That's often where you can find your mission. If you're bothered by injustice, you're concerned about elderly people, you love little babies, you like tinkering with stuff, you broke down stuff makes you angry, you like to make new stuff. That might be a hint. What problem did God place you here to solve? You ever ask yourself that? Does anybody know the problem you're here to solve? So, Brother Steve, you raise your hand. What problem are you here to solve? Developing people. So undeveloped people causes you either anger or sadness. Typically, things that motivate us either make us angry or they make, make us cry. Make us sad, make us cry. And sometimes being angry, you cry when you get mad. Right? Anybody else? What is, what, is your, what is your problem? This is a big deal, man. This, this is amazing work. This is, this is life-changing stuff. What problem are you here to solve? Yes, ma'am. putting the J in the joy of older people. So older people who are not cared for, not taken care, that makes you either angry or makes you cry or both, right? But that, both, okay. So that is your problem. This is the question I want you to go home with today if you don't know the answer, because this will reframe perhaps your career, how you spend your time. What problem has God uniquely shaped me 
like the little spinner thing, that's the only thing that it does. But if you have that and you're trying to take care of that problem, it's the beautiful thing. Now they got an electric one. You put it on your drill, even better. Even better technology, right? But ask yourself this question, and more importantly, ask God. And if you are alive, you still are here to solve some problem. So it's hugely important. Let's keep going. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and then verses 23. Remember, God said everything he created was good. He said, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is very good. And then we fast forward. Next chapter. And God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. He's looking at Adam. Adam is naming all the stuff, doing his thing. And so he says what? I will make a helper suitable for him. So God said, Adam has a problem. Earlier, we saw that God had a problem. God had a place. We call the earth a colony of heaven. God wanted this thing to be full. He wanted to be subdued. He wanted to be developed. He wanted the ideas to be pulled out of it. He wanted the ores and the various things that are in the ground to be utilized to benefit the advancement of his presence on the earth. So he says, it's not good for the man to be alone, so I will solve the problem. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the man gave names to the livestock and the birds in the sky and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So Adam was in a situation, listen, where he could not fulfill his kingdom assignment. That's a problem. Because each of us have a kingdom assignment. Right? It's connected to that problem thing. But there's also a domain, there's a sphere in which you're supposed to bring that influence. And so Adam was supposed to fill the earth. And God said, he looked at the situation, he said, this is not good. It's not even saying that he was lonely. It just says he was alone. And so it's not saying that everybody has to be married or whatever, but Adam had to be married because his assignment was to populate the earth. Amen. And would you agree it was impossible for him to do that by himself? Amen. So he had a fundamental problem. He was alone. There was no suitable helper. And then in Genesis, uh, in verse 21, 22, it says, Then the Lord made a woman. God created a solution. So do you get it? Eve was the solution to Adam's problem. Now, see, some of us, you think that your spouse is your problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> but God's like, no, Eve is not your problem, bro. In fact, she was created as the solution to your problem. But if you see your solution as your problem, guess what? You have simply exacerbated your problem. You're not only not getting done what God wanted you to get done, you also now are experiencing all kinds of difficulties. And so anyway, he brought the woman to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called womb man, woman, for she was taken out of man. So God created the solution to Adam's problem. Then Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve. Why? Because she would become the mother of all living. So now he could fulfill the assignment, the call, through the solution that God created. And he could then exercise dominion in the context of the garden, but ultimately over the whole world. Do you, I mean, this is really mind-boggling. Do you realize each and every last one of us, if you buy the idea that God created the heavens and the earth and that he created these two people, each and every last one of us are related? Because God created a solution to a problem. And often we try to highlight our differences, but the truth of the matter is that's your cousin. Look at the person next to you say, you my cousin. <laughs> Yeah, you, you're my cousin. Right? That, all of the differences and the beef that we have with people, if we just like take a minute to think, be like, listen, this person is my cousin. We're family. And actually, it's even closer than that because when the world was destroyed, we actually all related to Noah too. Right? And so Eve 
because she was the solution to the problem. She became the mother of all living. Now, in 2021, last year, something amazing happened. College athletes were able to receive payment for their name, their image, and their likeness. College sports, pre-pandemic anyway, college sports generated about, I believe, I read it was, I want to say like $44 billion. And in Scotland, you know, and the excuse is, well, we give these kids free education. And that number is 986 million, if I believe. Less than $1 billion. Let's call it one round up. And so the other $43 billion made on, I was gonna say the backs, but that's probably about right, on the backs of these young men and young women, the universities keep. And so this rule, this law, it started in California, and then of course it went everywhere, because then folks who've been running in California for <laughs> the play, right? Now young people can capitalize on their name, their image, and their likeness. This is a big, giant deal. I'll give you an example. This young man who you probably never heard of, Hersey Miller, Master P, you heard of Master P, we, we old enough to know Master P. Master P's son signed a deal with Tennessee State before he ever set foot on the court for $2 million. Kids can do signings. They can, you look, a basketball player, you can say, I got a summer camp coming up this summer and charge people. And so now you have these young people. This kid has never been on, had never been on the court, and he signed a $2 million deal with this tech company. Because why? They realize that his father, people don't even know him, but they know his daddy. You know his daddy is connected. And so the idea is to be connected from a marketing perspective, to be connected to somebody who's famous. Do you realize people get paid thousands of dollars for Facebook and Instagram posts? It's estimated, I think it's uh, Shaquille Otis, estimated that he gets like 10 grand per Instagram post. People pay these young people who have all of these followers. You know, now some of us just tinkering, messing around, you ain't really got no friends or followers. These jokers got millions of people following them and they, will, they get paid thousands of dollars just to make a post. They're not putting up no foolishness. They're not showing you their breakfast unless they're showing you the brand. Amen? <laughs> And you're like, I'm not eating no Wheaties, I'm eating, who, who makes Wheaties? Post Wheaties, whoever makes Wheaties, right? I'm doing advertising, I'm not just up here showing you what I'm doing. And so think about the power of this idea of controlling your name, your image, and your likeness. This is crazy, but guess what? God gave us his name. His image, and this is what the Bible says. Genesis 1, 26 and 8. Then God said, let us make man, he names us, in our image and in our likeness. And God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so this idea of being, it's not that we look like God, but the image of God. See, in that time, kings would put, in areas that they control, they would put up, a statue of themselves, and it was a demonstration of their influence over that space. So I would put up a statue of myself in Homewood, in Lawrenceville, in, in, in Shadyside and Squirrel, and I would be demonstrating that I have dominion. I put one up in Sewickley. It might tear it down, but I put it up there anyway. <laughs> to demonstrate that I have influence, that this is my domain. And so being like God, it means we have a personality. We have the ability to feel. We have emotion. We have the ability to think. We have the ability to create. We have the ability to speak. We have the ability to influence the world because that's the beautiful part. God put us here to be his presence on the earth and to bring his influence to the earth. This is this whole kingdom idea and the, the earth being a colony of heaven. We're supposed to bring God's will to manifestation here on the earth. And so we have to be like our father, the king, because we're supposed to do his work here. On the earth. Does that make sense? And so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And on the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created him male and female. And he blessed them and named them mankind on the day that they were created. It says he called Adam. Adam was actually man and woman, my, mankind. He created them in his likeness. He created them like him so that they could bring his influence, his imprint, his fingerprint, if you will, to the world. And so as you go to work tomorrow, as you go to school tomorrow, as you go home this afternoon, are you asking yourself, where's my kingdom assignment? What is the influence I'm supposed to be? What does not look like God's will being done here? What does not feel like God's will being done here? If your house smells bad, that's not God's will. Amen. So how do I bring the influence of God even in the smells in my house? When I go to work, is the work, do people cheer when you come in the door? Or do they like, oh, God. <laughs> like, are people glad? You know what people do on remote opposite days and stuff? Are people glad on Tuesday and Thursday when you work at home? <laughs> or do people like, man, I wish, you, I wish he was here today. If we're bringing the presence of the kingdom, people should be excited when we walk in the door. People should be glad to see us. Because why? We bring solutions to problems. Are you a person who volunteers? If there's a problem, do you, you run in or you run away? Right? If there's something that needs to be done, are you the person who hides or are you the person who raises your hand? If we're citizens of the kingdom and stuff is going on that shouldn't be, and it doesn't look like God's will, we should be the one to be like, you know what? I'll jump in. I'll help. Is that you? Are you a problem solver? Listen, if you came and we were interviewing with somebody, you interviewed with me, he said, listen, sir, I'm here to solve problems. What problem do you have? I'm here to solve it. A word? <laughs> For real, though? I shared this story yesterday in a meeting. When I started my new position, uh, there was a young lady there, and uh, there's all this paperwork, and clearly not my strong suit. Vision guy, paperwork, no, no. She says, listen, we won't let you fail. Do you know when it was time for raises, you know who got one? <laughs> I was, listen, it was me, her, or some other people in the office. I was like, oh, she's on the raise list. <laughs> Let's be crystal clear. I'll wait. <laughs> right? Why? Because of that mindset, her attitude. We won't let you fail. Whew. Man, as kingdom folk, is that the spirit that we bring? Do we say, I'm bringing the influence of the kingdom of God to this place? Amen. Sister Teresa, when they come in that hair as nappy as what? Do you run or you be like, girl, I got you. We're going to send you out of here a different person. Amen. Listen, the tip be bigger than the, than the price. If we get this mindset, I promise you, things will change, man. This is who God wants us to be. People who bring his presence, who bring solution, who come in the door with the expectation to bring this place under the dominion of our king and then have opportunity to testify. You see, listen, if, if I hire you and you're bringing in revenue and you're making this business successful, you can talk about Jesus and anybody else you want to talk about. Amen? You come in being productive. You increase revenue by 5, 10, 15, 20 times. I'm, listen, I'm like, this person is about to share their faith with us today. You go ahead, witness. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Ward, lead us in prayer, praise and worship this morning at the job. You want to anoint the, the people, we'll do that too. Anointing will be at noon. Be there. Mandatory anointing. <laughs> See what I'm saying? If we come in delivering, guess what? That gives you influence. It gives you power. It gives you the ability to speak to the place. Let's keep going. It's interesting. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 to 23, and then verse 38. And it's talking about Jesus. We're talking about this idea of 
God gave us his name, image, and likeness. The people were being baptized. Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened up. The Holy Spirit descended on him in the form like a dove. And a voice came from him, you are my son, whom I love. And with you, I'm well pleased. God is modeling something for us. But did you know that God had two sons? Y'all know how God had two sons? I knew God had two sons. Got no hands up in this place. And this is, all right, look, Fred, look, Fred know everything. You got any questions, ask Fred. Fred know. But other than Fred, this is like last time, other than Fred, the rest of God had two sons. You don't believe me? Watch this. Verse 23. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. Now, watch this. And so this chapter is giving the whole genealogy of Jesus Christ. And watch what it says. The son of Heli, and it goes through the, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. Watch this. The son of Adam. And the Bible says that Adam was who? The son of God. You're welcome. And Adam was the son of God. Now, let's do a little bit of homework. If Adam was God's son, so I'm John Wallace Sr.'s son, I have a son who's John Wallace III. Now, technically, he's not John Wallace Sr.'s son, but he is because he's my son. So therefore, he's the grandson of John Wallace III. Of, of John Wall Sr., so he's his son. Is that true? <laughs> and so therefore, we find ourselves being the sons and the daughters of Adam and Eve. And so we have the image, the name, and the likeness of the creator, God. Wow. And so here's our homework. Resolve, first of all, to reverence and obey God. It says this is where we start from. If any questions, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13 says, this is the whole duty of mankind. To revere God, to fear him, to honor, exalt him, and to keep his commands. So that's one sentence. That's all you really need to know about the Bible. Then today we talked about this idea of dominion and problem solving and so forth. So ask God to show you your kingdom assignment and the problem he's created you to solve. You're never too old. If you're still upright, still breathing, God puts you here to exercise dominion over some sphere and to be a solver of problems that he will be glorified. And then finally, embrace the fact that you have God's name, his image, and his likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Perhaps you've never heard this stuff. So if you have never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the way for you to be clear about your kingdom assignment is to ask the creator. If you don't know what you're for, what you're here for, what you're supposed to do, it's simple. Ask the one who created you. Say, God, why am I here? What, what problem am I supposed to solve? He'll let you know. But in order to do that, begins with a relationship with him. It begins by you saying, God, I don't, I don't know what, I'm tired, I can't do this, I need your help. So the scripture tells us we need to be rescued from that situation. The word that we say rescued, that word we say is saved. And it simply means that when we recognize that we have a problem, and we all have a problem, and the problem that Jesus came to resolve was the problem of sin. From Adam to today, we're all sinners in need of a savior. And so Jesus came to solve the sin problem. Because sin has to be paid for. The problem is, none of us could afford it. And so Jesus volunteered. Or at least he obeyed, God told him, and he accepted. He says, I'll go, I'll put on a flesh suit, I'll live life as a human being. I will live a perfect life. I will be tempted just like they are. I will experience the challenges that they experience. I'll go through what they've gone through. And then I will take the weight of their sin. I will bear the price of their pain. I will take the stripes on my body. The Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. I will pay the price that they would have had to pay themselves. And I will die. But the good news is then I'll be resurrected. And this is the rub. This is the challenge. 
If you believe that Jesus Christ died and paid the price for your sin, and if like the verse we started with, you're willing to honor and reverence God and obey his commandments, to live life as he designed it, that's called surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, his lordship. And you believe that Jesus did that? And that he was resurrected? And the price for your sins were paid for? You're like, okay, I, I'm with that. Then the Bible says that you are saved, rescued, forgiven. And then you can live the abundant life. Life as God intended, as God designed it. You can figure out your redemptive domain, the territory for which you're responsible. You can understand better the problem that you are uniquely created to solve. And between now and whenever you leave here, you can be about the business of destroying Satan's work, magnifying God's name by fulfilling your life purpose, making earth more like heaven. And then ultimately, the scripture tells us, we spend eternity with him in the new heaven, the new earth. Revelation 22 taught us and then we will reign for him forever with him. And so today, if you want to make Christ your king, I invite you to do that. Or if this, if this, this message is turn on some lights for you, as we're praying, I want you to ask God, God, explain to me, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What's my kingdom assignment? What problem did you create me uniquely to solve? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for today. Lord God, I thank you for this word, God. I thank you for the opportunity to be used as a vehicle to articulate the truth of your word, to share the wisdom that comes from your scriptures, Lord God, the instruction manual, the constitution of your kingdom. God, I ask that you allow this word to sink deeply into our hearts. Help us to recognize, Lord God, that we have your name, your image, your likeness. We are your children, and therefore we have access to everything that you have. We have wisdom, we have knowledge, we have power, we have resources, we have money, we have relationship, we have everything that we need to accomplish your purpose on the earth. And look out for those who are desiring to know you as their king. Look out, we pray with them now and acknowledging that we have that problem called sin, but we have a savior who died for us. And we surrender our lives to him. And we ask him to come in, take over, take charge, and be our king because we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and we believe in our heart that you have been resurrected from the dead you tell us in your word that we begin the journey and we are saved and so God for that we give you thanksgiving we give you praise glory and honor and I pray this prayer now in the name the power and the authority of Jesus Christ amen and so today if you made Christ your king I ask that you would type into the chat saved we'll follow up with you if you're here in the building catch us after service and because we've already done our announcements and taking our offering consider yourself dismissed lord i belong to you amen have a great week <laughs>